Good morning. Welcome to Shutesbury Community Church this morning. We're so glad to have everyone here today. It's a wonderful, sunshiny day outside, and the day is full of blessings from our Lord. We're going to begin this morning with the invocation in Lord's Prayer with Chris. Good morning. Heavenly Father, today we thank you for your many blessings. With all our trials and tribulations, you have blessed us abundantly. You've blessed us with family and friends and opportunities. You've blessed us with a church family and the teachings to grow and flourish in your kingdom. But most of all, you've blessed us with the promise of salvation and eternity and life everlasting. So let us all join together in reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Leave us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Again, welcome to Shutesbury Community Church this morning. We're so glad to have everyone here. Um, we do have a few announcements. The women's retreat next Saturday morning at, um, from 9 to 11. And there will be a guest speaker. The, the topic of the retreat is gratitude. And so I don't know if if that's just a show up thing or uh yeah you can just okay. show up i just mean if up. you want to let me know you're coming that's great because <laughs> i want to make sure i have enough stuff for everybody but um i hope i think that uh it's fine to just show up <laughs> and veronica's looking particularly festive today with oh. a, a little hair adornment and <laughs> So um, that's going to be a wonderful opportunity. There is a guest speaker who is, you remind us of that. Joy Toll Chandler. She's the pastor at Hope Methodist Church in Belchtown. Right. And so um, I hope a lot of people go to that. Also tomorrow, I mean, uh, next Saturday in the evening is our second uh, Chasing Vines dinner and discussion. And if you let us know in the next few days, then we can add you to the list. It's going to be a Greek dinner this month, and that's very exciting. Um, Karine is going to be working on that, and Ann too, I guess, and maybe others, pull up putting together some Greek food. So that will be an adventure uh, for the taste buds. Today after church, we have a vote on putting in the egress door downstairs so I hope that those who are members will hang on upstairs here for a few minutes so we can do that vote. Um, today's the Thanksgiving food pantry collection and if you didn't bring anything then we, you can leave it at the post office on the porch up until Wednesday night. Phil picks it up Thursday morning. We have a good amount of stuff downstairs already. We're hoping to set a new record and we had a huge record not too many months ago of over 200 pounds so it's going to take something to set a new record today. Uh, the annual community Thanksgiving brunch. Invite your friends. Bring lots of food because we hope that we get extra people. Uh, that will be November 21st right after church. We kind of wait till 11 a.m. to eat. We don't dive right in so that we get give people an opportunity to get here. And you can read the rest of them. Um, I think that's, that's all the, oh, one other announcement. The um, gratitude night, which is, was scheduled for no November 28th, we are gonna postpone. There's just simply too much going on. And so we're looking now at probably late January. And I will announce a, a date on that sometime in the near future. That will be a Saturday, um, Saturday night event with because it's January, probably a Sunday night snow day. So, and that's it. So, let's go to our Lord with our voices and sing his praises this morning. Mm 
Um, you're welcome to come up, Jen, <laughs> or anybody else who wants to join her. Are they opening? We'd love to him? have the choir expand. Not the one person expand, but <laughs> multiply. <laughs> Sorry, okay. Jen. Isaiah 55, verses 8 through 12. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return to it without waking the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire, and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands.
prayer requests from online or in the basket this morning. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus Christ, because you lived, we can not only face tomorrow, tomorrow, but face tomorrow with joy in our hearts and face tomorrow with eagerness to know what plans you have for us, Lord. We know that you have taken hold of us. We know that you have put the Spirit in us, that you have given us the joy of the Lord. And we are so grateful, Lord, that you have done these things for us. And we pray, O oh Holy One, we pray that you will lead us and guide us, that you will help us to be strong in doing service for you and for the people around us. We pray, Lord, that you will give us motivation to step forward and use those gifts, those, those talents and spiritual gifts that you've placed in us for the betterment of our church and our community and our world. Lord, we just pray that you will help us to be better at serving you and better at serving the people around us. And we are just so grateful, Lord, that you walk with us each day, every day, every moment, that you are there to hear our prayers, that you are there to help us through tough times, that you are there whenever we need you, whenever we turn to you. And we know, Lord, that we turn away so often. And we are so remorseful that we do that. And we continue to do it. And Lord, you don't deserve that because you are the God of glory and the God of, God of mercy and the God of might. And you created each one of us and you deserve all of our attention and all of our love. But Lord, we do turn away and we we do sin. And so we, we confess those sins, Lord. And we pray that you will forgive us, that you will have mercy upon us. And we thank you, Jesus, that you died on the cross so that our sins could be fully taken away and that we can be assured of heaven after we finish with this life, heaven in our afterlife. We thank you so much for that. We pray this morning for a number of people. We pray for Jana. We continue to pray for Jana, who is going through cancer treatments and who is such a strong person, but cancer and the treatment for it can do such, a, such damage to people. We just pray for you to heal her, Lord, to hold her in your arms to give her strength to get through this, and we pray for her family, her son, her daughter, grandchildren, her son's, son's wife. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll be there strengthening them, comforting them, and helping them through this most difficult time for the family. We pray for Colleen, who's so lonely, Lord, and needs compassion, needs love, needs people to be with her. And we just pray, Lord, that you will provide that, that you will bring people into her life. And we're grateful that you have brought us into her life, Lord. We pray this morning for Nicholas, a 17-year-old who just underwent surgery for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And he'll be starting radiation, Lord, and that's such an ordeal and so difficult for the individual but also for the family. And so we just lift up him and his whole family, Lord, and we pray healing upon him, we pray that the treatments will be completely successful and that he will be totally healed, Lord. We pray for Jen's aunt, also Jen, who is battling brain cancer, and we just pray, Lord, that you will just encompass her in your arms and just hold her tight to you as she goes through this battle, that you'll give her strength and that you'll make it successful, Lord. We just pray so much for her and for her family. We pray for John and his joint issues. And we don't know exactly what those are, Lord, but we all have had them in our lives, I'm sure. I know I have. 
And Lord, they are just so difficult. And, and so we pr pray that you will ease the pain and heal the problem and uh, bring healing to them, Lord. Lord, we pray for Becky and for the girls and for Phil. We pray for Peggy, who uh, is doing pretty well. Um, and for Ayers. And Lord, there are many more I know out there who are hurting in one way or another, and we're going to take just a moment to pray for them individually and silently, as well as to lift our praises to you. Lord, you have given us great blessings here in this church. You've given us blessings individually, and you've given us blessings as a congregation. And we are so grateful, Lord, as we move forward. We just need to have your guidance. We need to have your direction. We have another vote today. We may have another vote in a couple of weeks on changes, improvements, moving ahead. And we know, Lord, that you are active in all of this. And we just pray that you will... <coughs> excuse me, that you will continue to guide us, to, to give us your wisdom, to show us your will, and just to help us, Lord, with, with all of this. It's, uh, it's bigger than us, and so it's not bigger than you. And so we just need, Lord, for you to show us the way and to make the way smooth. We thank you, Jesus, for going on that cross and giving us hope, hope for life eternal, in the presence of our Lord and our God. And we pray all this in your holy name. Amen. Levi doesn't have to be so quiet. Um, we are beginning Sunday school and, and nursery today. And I had hoped that our young ladies would be here this morning, but they are not. So um, I do have a... Um, a children's sermon, but I think I'm going to hold it till next week because I don't think Levi would get a lot out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but we will sing a song, um, Jesus Loves Me, as Levi and the Sunday school teachers will go downstairs. So we will be having Sunday School and Nursery the second and fourth Sundays of each month. So if you have children,
grandchildren, no children, invite them to come to church on those Sundays in particular, and we will be having um, nursery and, and a Sunday church school. Um, we also need at least one more person to expand that to every week. And if someone would want to come forward and be in a rotation to do Sunday school and or nursery, then that would be very helpful um, because then we could offer it every week. But first we need to get some children here so that, uh, so that we can um, have some children to teach and to give our children's sermon to. <clears throat> our offering quote, Phil, could, would you mind doing the, the offering today? Our offering quote, our tithing quote this morning is from Romans 12, 1 to 2, and I thought I'd, I'd do a little diversion on this. As part of our offerings to the Lord, God made clear through the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that we are to give more than our possessions to him. We are also to give ourselves. Now, giving ourselves is, a, is, a, is certainly a kind of offering, but it's not a tithing. When we talk about tithing, a tithing means to give 10% of your income. That's an Old Testament um, command to the Israelites. Many New Testament Christians do that also. Some don't. But when God speaks about giving him, giving ourselves to him, he's not looking for 10%. He's looking for 100% of us. And Paul writes in uh, Romans 12, 1 to 2, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So we've been talking lots and lots about prayer, and of course it's through prayer that we make that connection with God, and through prayer and communication, we give ourselves to him, and he wants all of us. He wants 100% of us individually and of us personally. So, um, those at home, there are two ways to give. Shutesbury Community Church, P.O. Box 679. That's on the screen, 01072, and the paypal.me slash Shutesbury Church. Let's rise and sing the doxology. <laughs> Father, we are so grateful that you have blessed us in so many ways. And Lord, as we give back a portion of that blessing, we promise to try to give 100% of ourselves, even as we give a portion of our possessions. And we pray that we and it will be used in your will and for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. You may be seated. <clears throat> um, I wanted to tell everyone before we start the sermon today that I did um, speak to Ayers and Peggy yesterday. They're doing quite well. Uh, they have moved, of course, into their condo. That was quite a few months ago. They're thinking of moving into a um, independent senior living location in sometime in the near future they're exploring them and Peggy is doing well hoping for a new treatment method working with doctors in Boston and they recently went to the Grand Canyon 
which I found very exciting because I've never been. And she said, you have to see it to believe it. You can't look at a picture and you can't be told about it. You have to stand there and look. So I was just so pleased about that. And they also asked that we as a church pray for Ayers' sister, Sal, who um, is getting up there in, in years and just needs some prayer. So let's take one second because I didn't think of this during the prayer time. Lord, we do pray for Sal. We pray for Ayers and Peggy, of course, and they're trying to do the best they can for Sal. And we just pray for her, Lord, that, that she will see her situation and understand that it's time for a change. And, uh, and we're grateful that she has lived so many years, Lord, and that she's a loving sister to Ayers. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're continuing on today with Christ in us, the high priestly prayer. And we've moved over the last two weeks through John 17 from verse 1 up through verse 19. And today we're approaching verse 20 to 26. But first we're going to look into the Old Testament. We have discovered, of course, in Bible study, we've in our Bible study over the past couple of years, we've gone through the whole book of Genesis, and now we've finished the book of Exodus, and we're, we're just in the very beginnings of the book of Leviticus, and we keep seeing the New Testament in there. We keep seeing prophecies or forward-looking to what goes on in the New Testament. You see prophecies of Jesus throughout those books. So we're going to go back into the 700s and early 600s B.C. this morning. The Lord called Isaiah to be a prophet to the people of Judah. And he charged him with bringing warnings about what was going to happen to the Jews and to the Israelites if they didn't change their ways. It was a time of prosperity in the two nations, the northern kingdom of Israel the southern kingdom of Judah, and they had split apart many years earlier, about three or four hundred years earlier. And they were two separate nations, but they were all nations, both nations of Jews, with their faith in the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible of the time, the five books of Moses. It was a time of prosperity, but along with prosperity, oftentimes comes sin. And so they were turned away from God. It was a time of idolatry and immorality and political corruption. Sound familiar? Kind of like the time we live in. The Assyrian Empire had been growing for, for decades, and they were a cruel and ruthless nation of warriors, and they'd started spreading spreading down from the north into the, into the Mediterranean area, into the Middle East. And they were conquering nations. And at this point, they were knocking on the door of Israel and Judah. And so God said to Isaiah, go and talk to those Judites. And he sent some other prophets to the north, to Israel. And he said, talk to them and tell them they must change their ways or things are going to change for them. Well, we know, we know that in 722 B.C., the Assyrians did, in fact, overrun the northern kingdom. And they took the, the Israelites from there, and they sent many, many of them and scattered them throughout the Assyrian world so that no longer was there an Israel. They were just a scattered bunch. And the country that remained as, as Samaria, was filled with people that the Assyrians brought in, people from many different nations who brought in many different cultures and many different religions, and it was never the same. It was never the same, and, and it became a, a separation between the Jews of Judah and the Samarians of Samaria that lasted even until Jesus' time. And the Sumerians were hated because they had turned away from their God. Well, Judah was spared in that time, that time of 722, because they listened a little bit. <clears throat> and they changed their ways a little bit. 
<coughs> excuse me. But it didn't last. And so the Assyrians were defeated by the Babylonians after between 700 and 650 or so BC. And the Babylonians were a very similar type of nation. Um, they terrorized. They were cruel and hateful. They were expansionists, like the Soviets of after the World War II. They just wanted to grow and grow their country and overtake other countries and rule them and bring in their own type of government. And so they came after Judah again. And between 606 and 586 BC, in those 20 years, they invaded Judah three times. And they took people from there and took them to Babylon. And they destroyed the temple and they destroyed the country. And they left it in shambles with most of the people gone. It was a horrible time, a terrible time in the history of the Jews. And God had sent prophets to warn them, but they hadn't listened. They had kept on doing what they were doing. And so God had brought destruction upon them. But Isaiah didn't just preach dire prophecies. He also prophesied beyond, beyond that time. He prophesied to the, a new time, a time of redemption, a time of forgiveness, a time when peace would be restored through the world. More than any of the other prophets that you can read at the end of the Old Testament, more than any of the others, he spoke of a Messiah and a coming salvation. Isaiah was the prophet of salvation. In fact, his name, Isaiah, means salva uh, salvation is of the Lord. And he preached about that. He prophesied about that. The word salvation appears 26 times in the book of Isaiah, only seven times in all the other prophets put together. So he was a prophet of salvation. And we all know some of Isaiah's prophecies. because We hear them, especially at Christmas. In Isaiah 9, 6 to 7, he wrote, For to us a child is born. Does that sound familiar? To us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the greatness of his government and peace. We should have a, a thing up now, Ian. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. And so many ch uh, Christmas sermons are built on that one passage out of Isaiah because it's a prophecy that was written 700 years before the birth of Jesus. And it so beautifully depicts what Jesus is for us. Later in chapter 53, if we go to the next slide, verses 5-6, Isaiah prophesies about the suffering of Jesus on behalf of all sinners. So if you look at Isaiah and you read the whole of Isaiah, especially toward the end, verse, uh, chapters 53 to 57 or so, you will see the life of Jesus just laid out 700 years before he was born. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. The Lord has laid on our Messiah, our Jesus, our Christ, our own iniquity. There's one more prophecy that speaks directly to what our sermon is about today the end of John 17, where Jesus is praying. <clears throat> and that is Isaiah 55, 10 to 11, if we can go to the next slide. It says, as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, 
so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. This is God speaking through Isaiah. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. Now we know that at the beginning of the book of John, the Gospel of John, he describes Jesus as the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus, Jesus Christ, was the Word. And when God speaks here through Isaiah about the Word going out into the earth and yielding fruit, spreading a seed and yielding fruit, and watering the earth. Those are all images that we see when we read the Gospels about Jesus. The spreading of seed, Jesus' parable about the four, type, four places where seed may land. The water, Jesus turns water to wine and he talks about the water flowing. God's word, as we know from the beginning of the Gospel of John, identifies Jesus as the word. And so here he is being identified by Isaiah 700 years before he was born. And in this one quote out of Isaiah, we see the whole purpose of Jesus coming to earth. Why did he come to earth? He came to earth to spread the seed. He came to earth to water the seed. And he came to earth to harvest what came from the seed, the fruit of the seed. And he promised, he promised that whoever would believe in him, those who took the seed and grew from it, those where the seed was planted in good soil, those people would have life everlasting in heaven with him. In verse 4 of John 17, next slide, we see, I have brought you glory on earth, <clears throat> this is Jesus praying to God. He's speaking to God. He said, I have brought you, Father, glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. He had finished spreading the seed. And then in verse 6, he says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. <clears throat> and in verse 8, he says, for I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. Now he's praying here about the disciples, not about us, just the disciples. And he's talking about sharing with the disciples the truth, the truth of God, the truth of redemption, the truth of God's justice. And Jesus has accomplished all these things. And this was, prayer was the night before he died, the night before he went on the cross, the eve of his death. And so he prays for those disciples, and in verses 15 to 19, he says to the Father, my prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from evil, from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. So what he's doing here is he's saying, I have to leave, it's my time. But the work is not done. The work is just beginning. The development of the church is just beginning and these disciples have been left with the word, they know the word, they have the truth, they're being sanctified in the Lord, they're about to be filled by the Holy Spirit in not too many days. And it will be their job to go forth and spread the seed and bring the harvest. But it's not enough just to pray for them because they too will have short lives compared to the life of the church. So Jesus goes on in 17, 20 to 26 to pray for all those who come after. He says, my prayer is not for them, the disciples alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, 
that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved me, loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. The glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you. And they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Now, in the first couple of verses here, we see that Jesus is praying for the unity of all believers. We must be one. We must be unified. And he did that same thing with the disciples. We pray for the unity of the disciples so that they can do the same job for the same purpose with the same outcome all together. And here he does that for us, that the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. That uni unity, unified um, work. So we talked about this last week at some length. So we're not going to go over that again. But let's jump to verses 24 to 26. Here Jesus tells the Father that he doesn't want to lose the ones who love him. He says in verse 24, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory. This is a promise for our future. I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory because Jesus at this time is looking forward to being lifted into heaven at the ascension and he will be at the right hand of Father and he wants us to be with him, with the Father. What a glorious future this is promises to us. And he's promising that he's going to intercede on our behalf because we do not deserve to be there. And only his intercession, only his death on the cross assures us that we will go there. So he will intercede on our behalf so that we will be judged righteous despite our sinfulness. He's also promising in this that it says to see my glory. We will see his glory. What a joy that's going to be to stand before the Father and the Son and witness the glory of them in heaven. And if you read Revelation about the elders in their thrones and stepping off the thrones and kneeling and bowing to God and song singing. It's a glorious sight if you imagine it in your minds. So it's a promise that we'll go to heaven and we'll get to see our Lord in his home, which will be our home, which already is our true home. But that part of this morning's portion of the prayer that I really want to focus on the most is the last verse of this chapter, the last verse of Jesus' prayer. And it says, I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. I think that's a sacrifice in and of itself that Jesus wants to be in us. I mean, imagine who would want to be in us but he wants to be in us. He says, for me, maybe, in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself, not just my love, that I myself may be in them, which is us. Now, our purpose in this series that we're doing on the prayers of Jesus is to understand the way he prayed, see the way he prayed, 
and learn from the way he prayed to be better prayers. And I think we need that. I think we all need that. No matter how much we pray, no matter how much time we devote to prayer, no matter how great of prayer warrior we are, we need to be better. We need to be better at that. And this key right here is the key. I mean, this verse right here is the key to that effort. If we believe that Jesus is always with us, and since he told us that he would send his Holy Spirit to permanently indwell us, we know that he is always with us. He's in there then we must also realize that Jesus is with us when we pray. Not just when we're walking around, not just when we're sitting in church, but when we sit down to pray, we have Jesus within us. And just that bit of knowledge, just that little bit of knowledge should help us to improve as prayers, to know that Jesus is in us ready to help. We're not alone when we pray because we're never alone. We're never without the Spirit inside of us. We're never without Jesus with us. We are never without the Father watching over us. We have the three persons of the Godhead with us at every moment of every day once we become believers, once we've given ourselves over to Jesus. So if we falter in our prayers, Jesus is right there to help us pray. If we don't know what to pray, the Spirit is right there to pray for us. Paul wrote in Romans 8, 26, which will be on the screen, I want those, no, I have made you known to them. Where is it? Here we go. We, I should stay over here. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. The Spirit doesn't even have to speak to pray. He just groans. And God, the Father, knows what he's praying. C.S. Lewis, in his book, Mere Christianity, which is one of my favorite, favorite books for, to simply um, describe Christian theology, and it's a book that every Christian, I think, should read, Mere Christianity. He wrote this, what I think is a fascinating explanation of the work of the Godhead in our prayer life. He wrote, an ordinary simple Christian kneels down to say his prayers. He is trying to get into touch with the God. But if he is a Christian, he knows that what is prompting him to pray is also God. God, so to speak, inside him. But he also knows that all his real knowledge of God comes through Christ, the man who was God, that Christ is standing beside him, helping to, him to pray, praying for him. So you see what is happening. God is the thing to which is he, he is praying, the goal he is trying to reach. God is also the thing inside him which is pushing him on the motive power. God is also the road or bridge along which he is being pushed to that goal. So that the whole threefold life of the three personal being is actually going on in that ordinary little bedroom where an ordinary man is saying his prayers. That is powerful. The man is being caught up into the higher kinds of life, is being pulled into God by God while still remaining in himself. That's the power of prayer. Prayer is not simply sitting and talking to some distant heavenly creature, some distant heavenly God. Prayer is having God inside of us, with us, as we express our greatest needs, our greatest hopes, our greatest desires, and when we express our desire for help and healing for others. This is what God, in his love for us, does for us. He puts, us, puts into us a desire to pray to him because he wants to have relationship with us. He sends his son to earth, the greatest sacrifice of all time, 
Just going to earth from heaven is a sacrifice, a huge sacrifice to leave, leave that glory and become a man. But then to die is such a huge sacrifice. Sends his son to earth to teach us how to obtain that relationship with him through belief in him. He sends the Holy Spirit to dwell within us so he's with us every moment of every day to guide us in our lives but also in our prayers as we kneel down or sit down or stand like Jesus and look at the sky and look to the Father. He's right here. I mean, we're looking up there, but he's right here, right inside of us. All of this is so he can have a relationship with us. All of that. Not that we're worthy, but he loves us. He loves us. And so if we consider those things when we pray and we reach into ourselves and find the Holy Spirit there and we reach outside of ourselves and find God in the world and seek God in heaven, then we will become more intimate with God. We will have more love of him in us because we let it in. And we will show more love from him to those around us. God does all this for us. He makes himself available. The three-person triad of the triune God makes himself and himself and himself available to us because he wants us to love him as he loves us. He wants us to love him. We are never alone <clears throat> in this thing called prayer. God in all three of his persons is there with us, prodding us, guiding us, praying on be our behalf when we're incapable of praying because the, the struggles and troubles of the world have overwhelmed us to the point where we just don't know what to say. He is there saying the things that need to be said. God has put a door of intimacy with him right in front of us. And he stands there and he holds it open and invites us to come in. Let's go in. Let's, through our prayers, join God in intimacy. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that you are with us in everything we do, and we just pray that we can get better in our prayer time, that we can get more focused on you, that we can intensify that relationship that we have for, with you, because we know, Lord, that you want that. You want us to love you. You love us so deeply that you look beyond our sinfulness. You look beyond our selfishness. You look beyond our waywardness, and you see our soul, and you want it. Lord, help us to give it to you. Help us, O oh Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final song today is Resurrection Power.
will be staying up here after church to vote on the um, egress door downstairs. And that would just, should take just a couple of minutes. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. May you go from here in the peace of Jesus, carry him, carrying him in your heart, and sharing his love with all that you meet. We pray this in his name. Amen.